What's up, Growth Nation? Welcome back to Scale or Die, the show where we uncover proven growth strategies from CEOs and growth experts behind some of the world's fastest growing startups. I'm your host, Dave Roganmoser, CEO and co-founder of Proof. And today we've got a new friend of mine, Mathilde. She is the CEO at Front. If you've paid attention at all, you've probably heard of her, probably read a Medium post. Maybe you didn't know it was by her, but her company uh, is growing really, really rapidly and is one of the most exciting stories that I've been following over the last couple of years. And I first heard about Front when we were in YC a year ago, and we're in the batch, and you know everyone's kind of trying to figure it out. And over and over, the partners would say, look at Front for an example of how to do things well. And I think we watched their demo day presentation and then just kind of started following them from there. And I personally, from afar, though I've never met her until today, uh, have, been, have learned a lot and become a better CEO just from her writing. So, Mathilde, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to finally get the chat in person. Thank you so much. I actually didn't know about YC, so I'm, I'm super happy to hear. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 totally. It was, uh, it was a great experience. And yeah, they, they pump you guys a lot, which is cool and uh, well deserved. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. So, I want to first kind of give you a chance, you know, tell us what is Front? You know, when did you start? Kind of where's the business right now um, as far as some of the metrics that you guys track? Sure. So um, what is France? So we're reinventing email uh, for the way teams work. So what it means is we're introducing collaboration, workflows, accountability, and transparency in a new inbox so that every knowledge worker can work more efficiently. So that's what we do. We started five years ago. Uh, we launched the product about four years ago. Um, and today we have 110 employees uh, in San Francisco and in Paris. We have over 4,700 paying companies using the product. Um, so these are some metrics. I'm happy to give you any metric because I've been sharing pretty much everything uh, about the company in the past few years. So just ask me anything interesting. So let's talk about that bit because I think that's really interesting. And, and I think you're kind of pioneering the transparency conversation that's kind of happening among like SaaS and startups. I think a lot of the other people I see doing this are more of like the bootstraps. It's Joel at Buffer and you know people that kind of have a little bit more of this like fully remote bootstrap type company. But then you're this you know venture backed company, kind of traditional Silicon Valley, but you're also like very transparent. Do you think? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Like, why do you choose to be so transparent in what you do? Um, it's a good question. So I think the reason why I'm transparent internally is different from the reason I'm transparent externally. So I can talk about both because some companies may choose one or the other and we choose both. So internally, um, we're a very transparent company. And so what it means is uh, every employee know pretty much everything about the business. So, you know, what, uh, how much revenue do we make? What's our runway? What's the feedback of our customers? Just what am I doing on a daily basis? When are we raising? Like all these things. So why am I transparent? One, because I think that it builds trust. Um, two, because I think it creates engagement. And I think engagement makes people happy at work. And that's one of the things that I try to do with Front. Um, and three, because I think it creates efficiency. And so I'm very obsessed over making sure that as we grow, we remain efficient. And I think transparency is a good way to prevent a lot of meetings from happening, to sync, because you don't need to. The information is accessible everywhere. So that's why I'm very much into transparency uh, internally. I think externally, it's different. I would say, so we're transparent with our customers. So for example, our uh, roadmap is public, so if you go on frontapp.com slash roadmap, you can see everything. I think the goal is to build trust with our, our customers, and that's really the reason why we're doing it. I think when I decide, for example, to publish all our you know, Series A, Series B decks online or how I share my time, it's more to give back. Like I don't have a special goal, but I just feel like I've been helped a lot, and I'm very grateful for everything that I've learned through other people, and that enabled me to be where I am today. And so if I want to give back at scale, then I'll just share everything I'm learning along the way. Do you have people externally that tell you, Mathilde, maybe don't share that, don't talk about the numbers, that's going to hurt you, or are people fine with it? So I think transparency is always uh, scary, and so I do have people that tell me that. Yeah, most people will tell me that. Um, like one example is this public product roadmap that we have. Like everyone has always told me, 
uh, oh, but it's dangerous because you're just dying your competitors what you're working on. And I think for me, it's always a balance between like what's the cost and what's the benefit. And so in this specific example of a public roadmap, the benefit is one, I gather a ton of information from our users on what they want because our roadmap, you can put mm -hmm. items on it. So I get feedback to build trust. And I think that is far more valuable than people that might copy what we want to do. And anyone that has started a company knows that it's not about the idea, but about the execution. So it doesn't matter much. But just in general, yes, transparency is, uh, is super scary. Anytime I'm doing an all hands meeting and I'm super transparent about everything, there is a little voice in my head that's telling me, ah, maybe you shouldn't share that. And then I share it and then it's always better because then you know that people trust you, people are working on the right things. They know why they're working on what they're working on. Absolutely, I found you know internally, so we've got 14 people right now and if we get the right people in the room, transparency is easy. But if ever I'm like wanting to hold stuff back, I'm kind of like, you know, do I have the right people? But also, is I like, well, yeah, what is that little voice in my head that's stopping me from doing that? But it always does pay off, I feel like, to be transparent, particularly internally, in my experience. Yes, for sure. And, and for sure, you need to have the right people that will deal with the information in the right way. But as soon as you have that, um, then you should be good to go. Uh, one thing I would add is over the past few years, uh, one of the things I've realized is transparency is not always great. So as much as we're transparent, I do think that there is, you know, good transparency and bad transparency. And I think good transparency is everything you can share that will help uh, people have more answers to their questions and bad transparency will raise more questions. And so um, one example of that, and that's, very, that's different from Buffer, for example, that shares pretty much everything, but one of the things that we've decided at front is we don't share the salaries of everyone and other companies do it. The reason why we don't do it is not because like I'm not comfortable with uh, whatever people are paid. Like if it was public tomorrow, I would be comfortable. But I think if it was public, then people would pay a ton of attention to it. And then, you know, there are sometimes some exceptions that you will make because I don't know, someone is sick, they need a different health insurance and therefore they will be paid more. But then if you need to explain to everyone every um, every exception, then you've really lost time and you've raised more questions than you've actually answered questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk about team building because, you know, that seems like a big reason why you do transparency and how do you create a happy team and a team that's thriving. And as I was kind of reading your Medium post, and I think the first thing I ever saw was, you know, your Series A deck was reading through that. But then I went to your glass door and that's when I got hooked. I saw there was like over 50 five star, like 100% five star reviews from your team, which I care a lot about culture. I care a lot about our team. You know, I care a lot about just like internally, are we doing well? Are we thriving? And I saw that's like a really hard metric, I guess, to create and creating a, a team that is that happy. So how do you, how do you create these happy teams? And, and has that come naturally or has that been hard for you? Um, I think... So I think it's natural in a sense that that's always what I've cared about. Now it's hard and I can explain to you some of the things that we've done. It's, you know, it's always hard to know exactly why people are happy. And I think um, there are a few different things. One is I believe that people are happy when they believe in the mission you have. And so having a mission that's clearly stated and they care about what it is uh, and they understand that the work that they're doing is impacting this uh, mission, I think is super important. Um, two, I think that, so that's usually how you attract people um, that in your company, then you want to retain them and make sure that they're happy. And so in order to do that, um, there are a few things you can do. One is, and I'll, I'll go back to transparency, but at the end of the day, um, one of my biggest belief is people are happy because they're engaged. And like they care about what they're working on, they understand what they're working on, and they understand that what they're working on will impact the business. And so, to me, uh, that's where like transparency around, you know, how will we get there? Where are we standing? What are the goals of the company? What are the goals of every individual? How are they doing? Do everyone know about it inside the company? I feel like this transparency around uh, the strategy and how everyone's goal relate to it is super yeah. important. Um, so I think that's something that makes people happy. I think uh, there are quite a lot of things that we've done to create uh, a better culture. So uh, for example, we have uh, 
and offsites, we used to have them every three uh, months and then every six months and now every year, but it's a company wide offsite. So the Paris team come here and then we travel somewhere. So in February last month, we, uh, we were in California. Uh, and I think that, you know, people spending time together is also a really good way to have a good culture. Um, we, uh, we do a musical every, uh, every year and it's a, you know, it's something where people have to accept to be very vulnerable in order to, you know, play or sing in front of a lot of people. I think that helps us build a good How did culture. you start, how did so, you start having a musical as part of the company culture? I, um, it started because I think one of our first employees, uh, uh, so she's uh, our head of recruiting, she's just a super good singer and she's passionate about musicals. And so she said, uh, let's do it. And it was easy when we were 15. Uh, and the last one was with 100 people. That's and amazing. so it was slightly harder to scale. But I think the, the thing I want to say here is, you know, there is not one thing, like there is not one magic recipe that um, that will uh lead to your company being better one thing i um i did last month is publishing uh, a book so there is a culture book where we explain exactly uh what our culture is like what our values are what they mean how we live them and i give i give a lot of concrete examples and at the end of the day i think that's what people need um i can give you one last yeah. example of this so one of our values is low ego and uh, so every week we have a company all hands at 9 a.m. every Monday. We go over, you know, all the metrics of the business, plus a few other things. I've also published how we do all hands. There is a template you can use for your deck. And at the end, you have awards. So some people uh, can be uh, nominated for Frontier of the Week. And there is a stumble of the week. So someone will say, you know, here is a stumble I've done, um, and this is what I've learned from it. And so that's a really good way to have this low ego uh, culture within your company. But I didn't invent that. I So one of my mentors is Jared Smith, the co-founder of Qualtrics. And I was chatting with him and he said, at Qualtrics, we do this stumble thing. And I thought, oh, it's great. It really fits with the culture that I'm trying to create and therefore I will implement it. So lots of things. Some of them are in the book we've published. Some of them I've just shared and some of them I've written about on Medium. Yeah, I uh, looked at the recent Medium post where you're kind of breaking down the uh, all hands that you have every week. And I think we're going to implement that stumble of the week and a few other things from that. So again, thanks for, thanks for posting that stuff. Um, I'm yeah, I'm curious about the two offices. Why did you decide to have one in Paris and one in San Francisco? Um, so at the, so we started the company in Paris, uh, then we moved everyone here, uh, because we went to Y Combinator and then, um, we moved, uh, and for four years, I decided to have everyone in one location. And at the beginning of 2018, uh, I decided to open an office in Paris. And I think, uh, it was for two, uh, different reasons. The first one is we wanted to scale engineering. Uh, we had recently raised our series B with Sequoia and so we, could afford investing more in uh, in EPD. So, you know, we have a huge network in France. The talent market is great. And so that allowed us to scale product. Um, and then 40% of our customers are outside the US. And so if we wanted to get more of them, support them better and expand within these accounts, it was better to have people there as well. So now we have an office in Paris where every function is represented, like we have you know, sales, success, mm. support, marketing, product, engineering, um, and we'll keep scaling both offices. Do you think you'll just have those two for quite some time? Or is there thoughts on when you would do a third or a fourth? Well, at the moment, we're just planning on having these two, and then uh, we'll see. But at least it made me confident that we can scale. You know, we have a really good tool called Front that allows us to be on the same page. It makes it so <laughs> easy so. to just run multiple offices. So easy. That, that's the that's the secret. I believe it. I love it. Okay, so I want to talk about growth. Uh, and for context, who are you guys competing with? Like, who are companies switching from, or what various tools they're switching from when they come over to Front? So uh, France is in between two markets. So on one end, you have email products like Gmail Outlook. On the other end, you have help desk solutions like Zendesk, 
intercom, service cloud. And today there is a gap in the market between these two. And the reason there is a gap is because a lot of different teams or companies need the workflows that are enabled by help the solutions, but they need it in an inbox. For example, because they need email features like collaborating on an individual in inbox and not a shared inbox, or like the ability to compose a new message or adding someone in CC, BCC, et cetera. So the question about like, who do you compete against is pretty tough because you know it will be 50% help the solutions, 50% mm -hmm. email solutions, uh, but, it's, but we exist because of this gap on the market. And then there are entire industries. So some of the verticals that we target are logistics companies, brokers, uh, real estate companies, hospitality, travel, and customer success teams, etc. And these these teams or these industries are people that need better workflows, but really need them in their. So do inbox. people get rid of both of those typically when they come to front, or do they kind of keep those for any extra tools? So depends on the size of the company. Uh, like we work with huge companies, and in general, we won't tell them like replace Outlook from uh, day one. So in that case, we would land first in one team and expand in other teams. But for smaller companies, they use Front and they don't use a help desk or a ticketing system and they don't use Gmail or Outlook okay, anymore. Okay, got it. And so you guys have been around five years, launched it four years ago. What have been the big growth channels that have worked for you? And have those shifted over time to anything that's been newer as of late? Yeah, so for sure they're, they've shifted. So at the, at the very, very beginning of front, it was you know, mainly word of mouth like everyone else. Um, I think for us, content worked really well. And I'm, I'm sure YC might have told you about this because I know they always tell people about front's content strategy in the very early days where we kept publishing content either on the topic of email because people like really like reading about email or on the topic of you know, starting a company. Um, and that got us pretty far. We didn't have a marketing team until 2017. Wow. So um, it's been two years. Um, so content helped us, but then every stage of growth, you need to diversify the, you know, the source of growth that you might have. And so, I mean, I can tell you right now, for example, there are a few things that we are uh, doing. One is, for the first time since the beginning of the year, we're going outbound. And so we have a team of uh, SDRs that will contact the verticals where we have strong product market fit. For the first time, we have a growth team within product and engineering where they are looking at expanding within current accounts, having more, having the product include more virality than it currently has. And so this is, the, that's just two examples of something we're doing like right now, but literally every quarter, we need to think about net new strategies that we can implement in order to sustain our growth and in order to be in control of our destiny because no, no growth channel will just scale in an yeah. unlimited way. And, and so two, you've only had a marketing for two years now. How big were you when you added that first marketer? Uh, I think we were probably 25 okay. people. In and the how did company. you know that was yeah. the right time for you guys? So uh, marketing hiring is probably one of the biggest mistakes I've done. So um, I had been trying to hire marketing for a while. And the mistake I, done, I did like many years ago was thinking, okay, so now we need to generate more awareness, more leads. I don't know how to do that. So I'll just hire someone that will figure it out. And one thing I learned is, you know, usually if you're the founder and the CEO and you don't know something, it's going to be super hard for someone to figure it out. And also marketing is so diverse. Like you have content, you have demand gen, you have brand, you have product marketing, just super hard for someone to know all of these things and then just implement them in a new environment. So I hired um, a few people, didn't work out. And then at the beginning of 2017, um, I hired people that were uh, more specialized. So we hired someone in demand gen just because we uh, saw that paid acquisition could lead to some high quality leads. And so we wanted to scale this. We had a, 
um, so front integrates with tools like you know Salesforce and Slack and Stripe and others. And so we we hired a partner marketing manager because we knew that we could do some co-marketing and that would work out. And so I think I what the, I just did a different strategy, which was what are the things that I think can work in scale and let's hire people for this. And then later on, let's figure out how we can bring the right leader on board. But that was a better um, solution than trying to find someone that would just solve so all So you were just willing problems. to roll up your sleeves and be like, I'm going to run marketing. You know, I don't know how to do the nitty gritty day to day, but I can figure out the strategy or at least take some bets. Yes. And I guess that's the story of my role is just I've been doing all the different jobs then I've hired people better than me, so I became the head of every function. Then I hired people better than me, so now I'm just making this team work really well together and bringing more people to this team because there are always gaps Very in cool. the organization. So one thing I remember reading in, I think it was, again, the Series A deck, this idea of like land and expand. And we're going to get in these organizations, and then we're going to get you know revenue expansion that's going to you know be net negative, ideally. Has that been a big part of the strategy? And like, what does that look like for you guys to come in and expand in these organizations? Yeah, so that's been a huge part of where our revenue comes from. Um, and you know, I've published these numbers that are uh, retention year over year net of churn is around 140%. So it means that uh, a lot of revenue comes from existing customers. So um, I guess there are a few things you can do um, to make this happen. So uh, the first thing is you should have a good product. Like if you don't have a good product, then your product will not expand, but that's not enough. Um, you need to have the right structure of team. So, you know, once you have someone as a new customer, how will you organize your account management team or customer success management team in order to make sure that you can expand mm -hmm. to more teams? So that's one. Two is how do you design a pricing that allows for expansion without being cost prohibitive. And three is from a product standpoint, how do you make sure that if one team is using it, that it can spread to more teams more easily? And I guess we've made, like along the way, we've made uh, some investments in these three categories so that we can uh, keep expanding within like existing accounts, whether they're four year old or four days so old. You, it doesn't just happen. You guys have engineered this to happen on top of a great product. Yeah, and I guess the it can happen by itself in the early days, but as your overall revenue number is increasing, then in order to sustain this, you will have to deliberate. So what does the future look like at Front? Where are you headed? Like, what's next for you guys? Um, it's a good question. Uh, so one is from, you know, from a team standpoint, we always try to have this balance of, we want to grow super fast, but we care so much of, about our culture. And we enjoy this period just because being small enables you to have you know, so much efficiency and engagement. So I think from a people standpoint in Paris and in San Francisco, like we'll keep growing, but we'll also be very deliberate and thoughtful about um, how much we grow. Uh, from a product standpoint, this year is super exciting because last year, we decided to do a full rewrite of our app. And so I, so we launched a new version of Front at the end of 2018. And it's wonderful because the app is much better, but it was also frustrating because we couldn't develop any new features. So now literally yeah. every week we have new things uh, going out. And so we're excited about, about that. Um, I think we're for, for this year, we'll just be in San Francisco and Paris. So we don't have you know, any, uh, any plan to expand internationally. Uh, and, you know, more people in the team just means different functions can be created and we so can just do keep new grinding things. away and keep doing what you're doing. Why did you guys decide to do the app redevelopment when you did? So the main reason is because when we started Front, I don't think I, I mean, I actually know that I didn't know Front would be, um, as successful as it is, and it's relative, like we're still super small. Uh, but the technology choices that we uh, made wouldn't scale to millions of users. Also, we're doing an email product. And so the app needs to be insanely fast uh, and super delightful. And we had reached what Angular would allow us to do. 
So at the end, like the, the main reason we did it is because we just wanted to lay the foundations for a large user base and the most delightful product you could think of. Um, and with the existing technology we had. And would you do that again, looking back? Would you build a really scrappy, light version at the beginning and then redo it all four years in? I would, yeah, I would do the same. Um, I think it was, uh, and also, you know, it was a lot of, uh, we had our uh, board meeting last week and uh, one of the things that the board said was they've never seen a rewrite being executed mm. um, so fast. It's still, it was like, mm. I don't know, nine months. So it's still a pretty long time. Uh, so the danger is the moment you do your rewrite, you're too ambitious and it never goes out and it takes two and a half years or it never ends. So I think I would do the same thing, but being very, very disciplined when you do your rewrite to not just change every single thing that can be improved because otherwise yeah, you'll never totally. ship anything. Very cool. All right, well, we've got to wrap up here and we're going to wrap up with what I call the salty six. This is six rapid fire questions just to get to know you a little bit more. Some about work, some about outside of work. That sound good? That's perfect. All right, so number one, when you're not running front, what do you do for fun? Um, so I do two things. One is I do a lot of sports. So I play tennis, I play soccer, I bike, I climb, I go kite surfing. And two is I play board games. Which board game are you playing right now that you like? Um, so I have a few different ones. Um, my favorite board games, strategy games right now is called Puerto Rico. Hmm. Uh, my favorite chill game is probably Code Names. Um, and then my favorite cooperative game where you're all in the same team is called Hanabi. Okay. We've been playing code names with the team here recently. I'm a big Settlers of Catan guy, but I'm going to check out those ones you said. That sounds, that sounds good. I mean, Settlers of Catan, there is too much luck. It's frustrating. <laughs> I disagree. I think it's all strategy, but... I, you know. I disagree. You can have the best strategy and then the dice run it with you and then you lose. That's true. Uh, Sometimes that does happen where everybody else gets the rolls after like the first five rolls and you're just out of it. Uh, yeah. I've seen that. Uh, okay, cool. I think I know the answer to this one, but do you have a morning routine? And if so, what is it? Yeah, so I wake up, I shower, and then I meditate, and then I go to work. Cool. That's it. Cool, cool. All right, how do you focus during the day? How do you block out time to get deep work done? So, um, first of all, every day I know exactly what I'm going to do because the time is blocked in my calendar. So whether it's in meetings or working on something asynchronously, like I know everything that I'm going to do. Um, two is I don't have any notification either on desktop or mobile because it's so distracting. I would be disrupted every single minute otherwise. Um, and three, one thing that I've been doing uh, that has been super helpful to me is every Thursday afternoon I go home. I just have a notebook and I have no computer, no phone. And the only thing I'm thinking about is what are my priorities? Am I making progress? What opportunity am I not seeing? What risk am I not seeing? And it's been super productive. So that's how I spend my days and weeks. Cool. Okay, what's a book that has impacted you deeply over the last few years? Um, so I'd say it's a book called Doing Good Better. Um, so it's part of a movement called Effective Altruism. Mm -hmm. The summary of the book is, if you care about the most good you can do in the world, then you should choose something you're really good at. And then usually you will create wealth because of that. And then you can reinvest it in whatever you think is most important. I like that. Doing good better. All yeah. right, I'm going to look that up. Okay, what's the best purchase you've made recently under 150 bucks? Uh, I would say it's a board game. <laughs> it's called, I have this new board game. You should buy it if you like code names. It's called Decrypto. Okay. Uh, it's very similar to code names. It's a new game. It was one of the best games in 2018. Um, and it's just like code names slightly better. Okay, cool. Decrypto. I'm going to buy that. I'm going to yeah. buy that right after this. We'll have it at the office. Okay. Perfect. And finally, what's a trait or characteristic that you have that has led to the success that you have today? Um, I, I would say, I think, uh, self-awareness. So I think I'm super self-aware. I know what I'm good at and not good at. I, and I have enough confidence to, you know, tell everyone what I'm not good at and just accept it myself so that I can work on it. I think the biggest mistake you can do is 
not accepting it and therefore not working on it. And how did you develop that confidence? Like, where does that come from to just be okay with being bad at a lot of things? So I think confidence, unfortunately, is not something that you can uh, work on by yourself. It will always be other people that will give it to you. And so being surrounded by people that believe in you is insanely important. And you should just keep meeting people that uh, will, like, just keep meeting people until you find people that believe in you. And so I've been lucky enough to have people in my personal life and professional life believe in me. And I think that's where my confidence came from. It's not one day I woke up and I was like, yeah, of course I can do this. Um, and if that's what you're expecting, it will never happen. Love it. I agree. Awesome, Mathilde. Thank you so much for being on. This has been incredible. If people want to find out what you're doing, where you're writing, where's the best place to find you? So they can go on our website, frontup.com, or they can go on Medium and type Mathilde Collin, and I publish a lot of things, or they can go on Twitter. Perfect. And we'll link all that uh, in the show notes here so you guys can find out what she's posting and also what I'm reading as well. So, very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on. Really appreciate it. And I uh, wish you guys the best as you keep growing. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next episode of Scale or Die.